I gotta say, it is a uh, it is a cool day when you're walking to work listening to an album, and then a couple of hours later, you get to actually hear it live by the man himself. So thank you very much, William, for stopping by our offices here in New York City thank you. and doing this live with us uh, here on Billboard Live. So let's talk about this album, OG Lala. It's out everywhere now, and it was uh, a collaboration with you and Rick Rubin. That's correct. Now that you, <laughs> I just get a nod. Uh, now you and Rick, this wasn't your first time, right? You guys linked up what once before in ninety eight. Yeah, we did a song called "Let Me Give the World to You." Okay. Now the what the big thing that a lot of people are talking about is this stripping away that you and Rick were able to accomplish on this new album. It's kind of similar to what Rick did with uh, Johnny Cash. Is that fair to say? I never heard that record. You never heard that record no, at all. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> no, no. I no. I've done a lot of acoustic work, but I think it's because the whole album is kind of this vibe. It mm -hmm. sort of surprises people, but. You know, we did songs like Disarm and lots of songs that were acoustic. So it's, I know it's it's funny how the world perceives something. You know, there's the reality and then there's the perception. So I realized the perception is loud and brash, mm -hmm. but the reality is, you know, I've always done music like this, but maybe this is the first time it's all together in one batch. So so was the rawness that we hear on OG Lala, was that a product of working with Rick or was that something you were setting out to do before Rick became a part of the picture? Uh, no, I, I sent Rick the songs and he was attracted to the vibe, but I went into the recording process um, prepared to, if he had said, let's do it with a brass band or something, I, I had no preconceived, like it has to be like this. So right. the fact that it turned out kind of close to the demos, like this sort of form stri stripped raw, um, surprised me, but I was cool with it because it sounded nice. You said something really cool recently about um, the recording of this record, that it was a return to form without feeling like going backwards. And that seemed like, a, I wanted to know, how did you accomplish that? That seems like sort of threading a needle there. Well, first you go crazy, and then you um, stop being crazy. Um, now, so being in a rock band, uh, particularly in, in, a, in a tumultuous decade like the 90s was for music, um, it takes a while for the tide to kind of go back out to where you sort of say, you know, sort of how do I fit in all this? And, you know... The, the rise of Napster, the rise of illegal file sharing, the rise of streaming. You know, I've been through sort of four evolutions of how digital technologies have affected the sort of the working artist. And so as you're sort of trying to navigate all that, you're also, uh, you know, maturing and you're into different things and you're trying to figure out if the audience is going to follow you or you're going to try to find a new audience. And so it takes time to sort of put all those pieces together. Yeah. I want to get back really quickly to this stripping away that uh, is really beautiful. What I like about it, the effect that it has, at least for me as a listener, is you know when you, when you strip it all away, it really just sounds like you're kind of hanging out with you know William Patrick Corgan listening to this record. It's a very intimate experience listening to the record in this stripped away yeah, sense. It, yeah. um, and what caught my ear though is when all these publications were making a, a big to do about the sound of the record and the rawness of it, is I know you had previously described going into your your record a door with the Pumpkins back in the, the late '90s as a stripping away process of sort of like mm -hmm. you know getting rid of some of the things that you had been doing for the past six to seven years up to that point with that band. Mm -hmm. Did you, going into this record or, or in the process of recording this record, did you personally feel any similarities between the recording of Adore and the recording of this? No, it felt really different to me. Um, this was probably the first time, and I've made, I don't know, 12 albums or something. This is probably the first time I, I went in, I, I was willing to follow the music wherever it went. I didn't have a, like, a particular agenda, which is pretty unusual for me. I usually know exactly what kind of record I want to make. So this was totally different. Um, and I just said to Rick, like, whatever you want to try, I'm cool with. Do you think that's going to be unique to this record? There's probably no way to answer this question or no way to know. But I'm just curious, is, do you think that's going to be unique to this record? Or do you think that's a new way to approach music for you as an artist? Uh, I'm probably more open to working with other people than I have been for a while. Mm -hmm. I think it, for me, the last sort of 10 to 15 years has been a very personal journey of, like, why do I m make music and what do I want to accomplish in music? Mm -hmm. And like I said before, as the goalposts kept changing of what is accomplishment, I mean, these days it's a common thing in, in the music business that people are less interested in sales and more interested in sort of buzz and streaming. And I mean, 20 years ago, that's like, that would have been like heresy. Yeah. Because you know, record sales was the bar by which you denoted something being important. So now you can have something that'll get like 70 million watches on YouTube won't necessarily sell a lot of records, but everyone agrees that that song... And that's the new metric. How do you well, feel about that? Well, that's one of the new metrics. I don't care. I mean, to me, it's all the same. It's just, you got to remember, during those years of transition from, let's call it the old music business to the new music business, no one could give you a straight answer of what success was anymore. There was no, like, hard and fast, like, this is success. And so it's taken a while for everybody, including myself, to sort of figure out what you would qualify as success because, you know, as you see, it's still a pop-driven game. And... Um, but you know that when you when you look, oftentimes you look at the actual numbers that the pop um, artists do, their numbers are actually not that big in terms of sales. Mm -hmm. It's more about this other thing, yeah, know, the, the buzz, cultural mm -hmm. impressions and engagement and stuff like that. Those, that's all new math. Yeah. 
I'm not going to dive too deep into the record because you've done a really great job in previous interviews of saying that sometimes, you know, you, there, you are at risk of over-intellectualizing things, and especially music. But I do yes, want to ask you... The worst crime with music is to, is to overthink it. Yeah. I do want to ask you about the first track on this album, which is a gorgeous song called Zoe. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, again, at the risk of over-intellectualizing just the track list and the sequence. Take a chance. Why did you go with Zoe to open the record? And if you have any memories of writing Zoe, because it is—it's just a gorgeous song. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I was—I um, was playing the piano at home, and I, as you do sometimes, I hit a certain chord sequence, and it made me start thinking of something that David Bowie would do. And David had passed not too long before that, and there was a show in Chicago that had all David's memorabilia. I, I don't know where it also went in America, but it was this massive show of all his amazing clothes and his videos, and like a multimedia show. And it was very, very. Um, uh, it, it really struck me because I knew David enough to sort of, you know, I remember things he told me in private, and so I'm, you know, I have my own soundtrack in my head of things he said to me, and I'm looking at the show and all these, you know, this, his cultural impact. And so as I'm writing the song, I'm sort of thinking of David and the person I knew, and and it, and so when I was done with the song, even though it wasn't written for David, it was like he was sort of writing shotgun with me during the song. So I thought it would be cool to name the song in tribute to him. And the decision to open the record with that song? Uh, I don't know. It's kind of weird because. Uh, at the time, it seemed to make a lot of sense, and it makes less sense to me now. So I don't know. Really? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, like I think it. I appreciate it, but it's, <laughs> I think it says something about the there's an inner experience of making a record and what your impression is at the time, and then there's an outer experience, which when people start to hear the record, they start giving you feedback, mm -hmm. and it actually kind of changes your perception. Mm -hmm. It doesn't diminish it; it just sort of changes it. It's like it's like saying to your friend, oh, I really like the movie, and, and then they'll say, yeah, I did, but that fight scene was kind of lame, and you start thinking, yeah, actually, it was kind of lame. It was kind of lame. Yeah, it sort of has a way of just sort of pivoting you a little bit. So I don't know if I – I think it's the type of record where if you ask me the question once a month for a year, I would keep changing the way I would want yeah. the record to flow um, because it, it it's changing for me still. Definitely. I want to talk about Pillbox. This is really cool. It's a silent film, and correct me if any of this is wrong, but it, you've premiered it already in a bunch of major cities. And is it – I've seen – the teaser, I've seen the trailer for Pillbox, but in your own words, is this something that can be listened to along with the album? That's the point, yeah. That's the point, okay. Yeah, we, 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 rather than just make a conventional music video, we, we, we made a 40-minute silent movie, and then we laid the album Moji Lala into the, the soundtrack. Okay. So you watch the movie, and then subconsciously you kind of take in the album. That was sort of the point of it. That's really cool. Would you be able to listen to this album, because it's out everywhere today, by the way, uh, would you be able to listen to this without the movie and still understand a story? Wait, say it again. So, would you would you be able to listen to this album, Oji Lala, without the visuals of Pillbox oh, yeah, yeah, of and course, still yeah. hear a narrative there? Yeah, it, I, I, you know, remember a few years back, it was that hey, if you if you put on Wizard of Oz and you listen to Dark Side of the Moon, so the point is, if you take two pieces of art and you kind of mash them together, something will happen. Eventually, there will be some form of synchronicity. So the album stands on its own, the movie stands on its own, but when you put them together, you get a different experience. That's that's not too dissimilar from taking um, illegal drugs. <laughs> Now, your fans uh, were, were hounding me on social media today about... Uh, My fans have a way of hounding people. They're, no, they're passionate. No, I dig it. Trust me. I deal with like a lot of pop acts with these fan armies nowadays. How would you, how would you quantify the crazy level? They're not as bad as, say, like a BTS. Have you ever heard of BTS? They're like a Korean pop boy band. Those fans are like... Everybody in this room probably knows about those fans. Those fans are... You hear the giggles. Those fans are crazy. Um, but they're up there. Maybe like uh, on par with a Belieber. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. But they want to know, will this be getting a digital release, Pillbox? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Once, Do we have a date? Well, last or? night I think was the last uh, premiere. Okay. So I think we are going to put the thing online for everyone to see. Oh, yeah. that'll be neat. All right. I want to ask you about a quote that I love that you said famously on stage somewhere. Uh, I think you were accepting an award maybe, about how when you put on a guitar for the first time, you put that strap over your shoulder, you, make, you know where I'm going with this? No. Oh. I don't. I say this, a lot this of things. This will be good. Side. No, this will be go good. Like, oh my God, what did I say? And where did I say it? And when did I say it? And what mood was I in right. when I said it? This is what's fun about live. Uh, so you said when you put that guitar strap over your shoulder for the first time, you make a decision, right? There's a fork in the road. You're either going to please these people in front of you at a show or you're going to push their buttons. Do you remember saying that? I do. Okay. I want to ask right now at this point in your career, what is your answer to that ultimatum? Um, don't have an answer. Honestly. No? No, I don't. I, 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 it sounds strange because I'm promoting, which is, you know, it's obviously an act this way, mm -hmm. but I don't, maybe for the first time in my life, I don't feel the need to sell anything. You know what I mean? I don't feel the need to make any decision. Interesting. I've made this decision and I trust God, somebody, to figure the rest out. 
which is weird because my you know I've spent 30 years very much thinking about this relationship. Not only as just a, a commercial artist, which sounds a bit bourgeois, but I mean also as a sort of rank and tour and a and a prankster and you know. I would say things in interviews just to get a rise out of people. You know, I would right. do all sorts of things just to see what would happen because it was amusing or, or, you know, courting controversy, uh, just to court it. So um, to go back to just being a musician and trusting that music is enough and not needing to sort of create a dynamic outside of the musical act is sort of new to me. That's really cool. It must be freeing in a it's way. Cool no? it it, it's cool if it works. It's cool if it works, of course. <laughs> Wait and see on OG Lala, right? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, speaking of your rabid fans, uh, we have some fan questions that were submitted via Reddit. There's actually a Smashing, I'm sure you well know, there's a Smashing Pumpkin subreddit uh, that they were very appreciative that we put it out there today of, hey, do you want to ask oh, that's cool. William a question? And they, they certainly did. So I will try to pronounce these usernames. They have very creative usernames here uh, as best as I can if you're watching at home right now from Reddit. Uh, Lucian Soul 2 wants to know if you can, if I can ask you how you decided to do this style of album and any hints about the SP album that you mentioned during your 30 days vlog. Yeah, I was doing a Smashing Pumpkins album, lost my mind, quit for the first time. I've never quit making an album, although I thought about it many times. What made you quit? Uh, I was just unhappy. Okay. Um, With how it was coming out? It just wasn't good. I mean, you know, you like to make an album that's good. And uh, so, yeah, so then I ended up writing a bunch of songs that became the songs that Rick heard that led to making Oji Lala. I never intended to make a solo acoustic record. It, was, it had a lot to do with Rick's support. So mm -hmm. I really credit him with sort of taking me down a path that I probably wouldn't have gone down on my own. Um, so yeah, so the Pumpkins album is sort of forever abandoned. Okay. Uh, Champler, sorry, Champler. I have been wondering at what point did he decide to stop working on Day for Night and start on a solo album? I think you just answered that. So, uh, oh, you know what? This is an interesting little add-on though that we didn't touch on. Uh, how much osmosis was there between the two projects, if, if any at all? Um, yeah, I, I originally announced that they're both projects were sort of twin mirrors of one another. And so were there, there were songs I purposely left off of the last Pumpkins album, Monuments, to put on what was gonna be the second album. Okay. Um, and so, unfortunately, there's one song that made that cut that ended up on OG Lala, which is a song called The Spaniards, um, which we played a few times live with the Pumpkins. But besides that, um, yeah, it just, whatever, it was like a ship that just went down into the ground. Mm -hmm. Holy Pig. What's up, Holy Pig? I'd ask him, what is he listening to these days? Because the last time somebody asked you this, it turned uh, this particular fan onto Fantagram. Oh, good band. Uh, I, I don't listen to any new music at the currently. Just classics or like really like you had Hon to have listened to music like what did you listen to no, Honestly when I'm when I'm working a lot I tend to listen to no music Okay I just can't it's too many voices in my head Do you listen to music for fun Like do you ever Rarely. just relax Rarely okay mm -hmm. All right If I listen to music uh, socially at yeah. home I mostly play bluegrass or old country Oh interesting That's pretty much the only thing that sort of doesn't cause a distortion in my brain all right. Krusty Ruffles, these names. I love these names. <laughs> are they great? Uh, are there still plans for a Zwan reissue, hopefully with unreleased material? Um, yeah. Um, uh, I had a band after the Pumpkins called Zwan in 2002, three-ish. And um, there's 65 unreleased songs, plus a ton of live recordings. And I own it, I own it all. And so the idea is at some point to create kind of a box set. But we, we got into a legal dispute with our, whatever our record label is these days, the Pumpkins world and uh so what was the last pumpkins reissue which was the album that came out in 2000 machina and machina 2 those are sort of languishing so i would want to do that first before i would do anything from the 2000s gotcha mcqueen writes out of the hundreds of songs you've written this is a tough question what song are you most proud of uh that's impossible to answer any jump out Maybe not most well, proud, not, maybe not number one. I don't know, the easiest thing is you reach for something that people would know, like 1979 or Tonight Tonight or something like that. But Does pride for you correlate necessarily with sales success or with commercial no, success? No, no, no. I think what it is, is the best way I could explain it is um, like a song like Tonight Tonight came out 22 years ago, something like mm -hmm. that. And it's weird. Somewhere along the way, after, I don't know, pick your time period, 15 or 20 years, it doesn't feel like it's my song anymore. It's like it feels like it's everybody's song. It's like it's become sort of a communal uh, road marker yeah. of the time. And, uh, and so I really enjoy that. Like, that's actually really cool. I think, wow, that's amazing that you even have one of those, you know, that you can, you know. And, of course, when I'm driving down the road and they play Smells Like Teen Spirit or something, I have the same generational memory of, like, the first time I heard this song sitting on a, you know, on a riverbank with Butch Vig, you know, and he's playing a cassette, you know, while he's making the album. You know, we were, like, one of the first people to hear that song in the world. 
you know, on a cassette, like a boombox, you know. So I go back to that moment, like I'm sure other people go back to some of my songs. So, um, yeah, at some point it feels like it's not my song anymore. So there's still a, a hoarder's gallon yeah. pile of my songs that, that no one can touch. That Butch Vig story is incredible. I love how you just casually like, yeah, everybody's got memories like this. You know, you're hanging it out. July, it was July 4th of whatever the year was, 91 or 92. Wow. Yeah. He had just come back from California and he said, uh, you know, we were watching fireworks or something. The sun's going down. And he's like, oh, you want to hear the new Nirvana album? <laughs> it's like, sure. It's like, sure. <laughs> so he had a boom box and he presses play and, you know, you hear the, the teen spirit. Dun, 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 dun. And I thought, wait, that's more than a feeling by Boston. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. And in a beautiful synchronicity, not too long after that, maybe six months, a year later, we were in Tokyo and Nirvana was playing and we went to see them play. And, um, and uh, they got to the moment in the show where they were going to play, play Teen Spirit or something. You, you just you got, it had a sense like here it comes or it was an encore or something. And Kurt started playing more than a feeling. No. Yeah. <laughs> and of course it went right over the... Yeah, the, the uh, heads of the crowd, but of but it was like, okay, so I'm not crazy. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's an awesome moment. Awesome moment. Uh, let's see, two more quick fan questions, and then I want to talk tour with you really, sure. really quick. Uh, we have Sid seven one seventy. I want to know about his disagreements with Rick Rubin on certain stuff because so much has been made about all the great music that has come out of it. Was there anything? Just I guess he's curious, or this fan is curious. Did you guys ever like butt heads over like something small? No. Really? So it was yeah. just pretty pleasant, like the entire uh, yeah. entire time. No, yeah. there was a, probably the only. Uh, sort of dissonant moment was Rick uh, was listening to a lot of electronica and after we had the basic tracks which you know like you just heard me play that's kind of the feel of what we recorded and it was like are we going to put more stuff over the top of it so he had the idea of sort of trying to put some electronic elements over it and we did about a day of it and um, I just stayed out of the way and, and let it happen and after a day he said what do you think I said I think it's awful <laughs> and he said okay cool let's do something else and that's when it went the direction it went so yeah. I mean if that's a disagreement I mean that's that's yeah. that's as intense as it got that yeah. you know reality dun, 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 you know yeah real Pretty small real producers of la yeah uh, <laughs> we have uh one last fan question this is uh, actually talking about is ian cohen here by the way you, you did a great interview with ian cohen from spin spins like our neighbors over here oh. so i don't know if he's in the room but he's not in the room we have i think i saw him doing cocaine in the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> um, that's like part of the spin uh, employee package, right? <laughs> you get free cocaine and Adderall. I, that? The break room. Well, while uh, William uh, Patrick you guys Corgan, share that? I've never been over there. Um, you said in this spin interview, which is a great interview, no matter what they're doing over there. Uh, I'm a weirdo. I got crooked teeth. I don't stand up straight. I play guitar funny. You saying, I like to write lyrics to songs about things that nobody fucking cares about. So this particular fan says... Um, I wish I, I wouldn't curse, though. I, <sighs> I need to... We'll bleep it. Uh, but he wants to know, how much do you care about the music that you write, particularly on OG Lala? Do these songs mean a lot to you? Are they important to you? Or are they more just fun little projects that you think sound neat? Well, the question's offensive because... In essence, I wouldn't be doing all this and being away from my kid if I didn't care and ask you to uh, give up your time. So, mm -hmm. no, I, I think what people get confused by is uh, music as a way of life. And I'd say this, I don't care who you are, like a rapper or an EDM artist. It's a total commitment. You got to go totally into the thing. And I think a lot of people like to project, let's call it this sort of slacker beauty idea of what it means to be a star or something that you just sort of roll around in gold dust and you know fairies come and bring you grapes or something you know what i mean it's like it doesn't really work out that way you have to be really really committed to your to your to your deal um everything else becomes kind of part of the circus part of it and you can play with it or you can act tough like i don't care or whatever but people misread the tea leaves on the way an artist navigates the sort of the media empire and the public sphere and they start to they start to make they start to make assumptions about who the artist is when all said and done most people if you get in a studio with them and the door is closed they're quite normal um you know i find most normal people are actually the weird ones <laughs> i want to talk tour tour kicks off tomorrow in brooklyn at the uh, is it the murmur what's the I name of that know. venue murmur theater i think maybe no one um, knows no uh, no one knows has ever heard of it 
I think it's it's relatively new from what okay, I understand. Is that what it is? Yeah. It is a cool room though. I have been there, so despite me not knowing, it's not name. a good thing when somebody says, "Oh, where are you playing?" And they say, "Go where?" where? Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It's a very cool room. It's a very cool space out in Brooklyn, and that show is sold out. So congratulations on that. And you're playing two dates, I think, in Brooklyn. And then what else is going on on tour? Do you know? Yeah, I think it's running through uh, playing, late November. Yeah, playing uh, uh, somewhere in Delaware, Wilmington, I think. Okay. Uh, Toronto, Nashville, two dates in Chicago. The four dates in LA are sold out, and there's dates in San Francisco oh. and one in Denver. Right on. It's a very short um, tour. I would love to play more, but you know, this kind of music in this crazy world is not e always the easiest fit. Right. And of course, for more details, of course, you can go to uh, William Patrick Corgan on social media and find yeah. There's out also those. a website, OG Lala, which is the name of the album. Oh, com, cool. And it has all the all the pertinence. Right on. You know, going back to that spin interview really quick and closing here, you mentioned that how by the time you're you're done with the press, you're pretty removed from the album itself because there's the recording, there's the writing process, the That's recording true, process. Yeah. And then by the time press is over, you said in the interview with Spin that you're almost ready to create. And I'm curious, after these shows, of course, you're heading out on tour beginning tomorrow, mm -hmm. but are you already thinking of new material? Um, actually, when OG Lala was done, I still was pretty wound up. So I actually wrote a, another record that I may go record the other album at the end of November. Oh my it doesn't have an, a name yet, but it's similar vibe as Ochilala. That's awesome. Um, I think working with Rick really got me motivated. So um, we'll see. And then there's this rumor in the air about pumpkins. So we'll see. Um, so it would be amazing if in if in next year there would be more of this type of music for me, and there'd also be new pumpkins. But you know, we'll see. We'll leave that to the rock gods or or the um, the drug addicted staff at Spin. They're like. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end this. That's William Patrick Corgan, thank you so much. Thank you,